but not, not off the front. You know, I would hate to see you tumble into the front row. Well, he's going to do it anyway. Um, careful. I can't believe you guys, this theater, allow those chairs, those steps to be there. Okay, um, John Husing, come on. We're going to get your PowerPoint set up. I got a clicker for you right here, and we're going to make this happen. So, anyway, thank you very much, Ito. I'm going to get off the stage. We're going to give it to John. Okay, and, got it. Yeah. okay. can you hear me? I can't see you, so you can see me. But I have a question. As you think about 2019 versus 2018, how many of you think that 2019 will be a better year? Raise your hands. How many of you think it'll be about the same? And how many of you think it'll be worse? All right, that's the forecast. It's really been nice being here today. <laughs> What you can see up here with the chart I have, the arrow is pointed to anxiety. Because as I think through 2019, I think we should be a little bit anxious about what's going to occur as this year unfolds. Uh, and even more anxious about potentially 2020. And I'll show you a bit about why I believe that. If you look at this chart, if this thing works, there it goes. If you look at that chart, what you're seeing is the month-by-month -month increases or decreases in U.S. employment. You can see one really high bar right after uh, around 2010. Don't get excited. That was hiring census workers. Then you see four negative bars. That was laying them off. But after that, it's been growing ever since. Uh, different paces. Most recent data, unusually strong, stronger than we expected. If we look at all that question, where do we sit versus the pre-recession peak, which happened to be in January of 2008? And the answer is the country is up 8.8% over where it was before the recession in the total number of jobs. So the U.S. economy in pretty good shape. Now, let's talk about unemployment for a minute. If we go back to the recession, it peaked at 10.1%. Most recently, it's down un unadjusted data, that is not taking out seasonality. It's at 4.5%, with seasonality put back in. Uh, that's when we adjust for the fact that January's always worked worse than December because Christmas is over, that sort of thing. If we look at that, uh, it's pretty low and it's about as low as it gets. So that is good news, the economy firing on all cylinders. However, this measure of employment does not include two groups of people. It does not include people who um, gave up looking for work when the survey was conducted at their door. Or second of all, they're working, but they're working part-time and they want to work full-time. If we add them in, what we see is unemployment peaked at 17.9. It's now down to 8.8. .8. Uh, not as good as it ever has been, but pretty darn low. So both of those things add up to saying that this economy is pretty close to being at full employment. Now, if you can think of a car for a moment, and you're driving along, and you've got the car moved up to red line, and that's about as fast as it's capable of going in that gear. Then you forget that you haven't shifted, and you floor the car. What happens? Bang! You just blew up the engine. Well, when an economy's at full employment, and you have a massive tax cut, one of the possibilities is for the economy to extensively overheat. And that means causing inflation. So this has been the big worry all the way through 2018 after the tax cut, that inflation was going to take off. Now, what happened? Well, this is a picture of, un of uh, inflation Consumer price index in red for, for the United States 
and in uh, black for California. What you notice is inflation started to take off and now it's essentially gone back down again and it isn't doing what we thought it was going to do. Why not? Well, it's turned out that there were a lot more people who dropped out of the labor force or had never joined it, who with the continuing expansion have added capacity into the economy. So we haven't seen the inflation we were worried about yet. Now, as those of you in real estate know, when you have worries about inflation, the place that shows up with the Federal Reserve is what takes place with interest rates. Now on the bottom is the 10-year bond. The top is the 30-year um, fixed um, mortgage rate. If you look at the two of those, you see they work virtually in tandem. And what have they been doing of late? They've been going back down. They had bounced off 5% for the 30-year mortgage, but it's backed off from that, sort of going along with the fact that the Fed has really backed down, um, and now we're thinking maybe no increases in short-term rates out of the Fed, which for the kind of businesses you're in could be good news. What they will be watching very carefully is the inflation rate. All right, there, are. okay, now, this is the worrisome chart. This is a chart showing as of February 28th, what was the interest rate yielded on government financed bonds, which are risk-free, what was the interest rate depending on the length of time that the, uh, that the debt would be held? from six months at the lowest level up to 30 years at the highest level. Now, looking at this part of the chart, from one year out to five years, if you look at those numbers, and I'll read them, 254, 252, 250, 252. So between one year and five year, what you would normally expect is that the five year the interest rate would be higher because of the fact you're lending the money longer, there's more risk, uh, you're worried more, you want a bigger return, but in fact, you're not getting it between one and five years. That's what we call an inverted yield because normally it should be heading up, not flat or going down. When we get out to the seven and then to the 10, we're up to 273, so it's a little bit better than it was at, say, two year at 252. We get out to 30, it's 3%. But the key here, this chart, is generally looking at the two and looking at the 10. How far apart are they? 0.21%. That's not 21%, that's barely at all. So it's essentially a flat yield curve. So what? If you're a banker, this thing scares you. Why? Because what bankers essentially do is borrow our money from us, uh, either for nothing or for short-term uh, CDs and things of that rate, and then they lend longer term, five years, 10 years, 30 years, and they make their money on the interest rate differential. The interest rate differential has almost disappeared. So then why would they be making a lot of loans in that case? Well, this sets up a scenario which could cause banking to pull back more than they have so far. If they do, that sets up the conditions for recession. And in the last four times, the yield curve is inverted We've had a recession within 18 months. When was the last time? 2007, going into 2008. So you see there is a prediction here, potentially saying 2020 could be kind of tough. Now there are other data that disagree with that. There's other data that agrees with it. But this is why anxiety is a bit of where we are as we look to next year, not so much this year.
Okay, so that's the U.S. situation. Not fabulous. Well, actually, at the moment, it is fabulous. Looking forward, as I say, there's anxiety in the mix, particularly when we go to 2020. Now, this is California. Remember, the United States is 8.8% more jobs than before the recession. How is California? If we look at California, what we see, 11% better. So California has grown more than the United States. Now, our area, the Inland Empire, swims in a sea of forces. And the sea of forces at the national level and the state level have been pretty darn good. So we should be swimming with the tide, not against it, which is good news for our region. Now, coming down to our region, let's talk about it. Just recently at the Inland Empire Economic Partnership, we had Senator Kamara Harris, who's now running for president, having been in office for two years. She's decided she's now qualified for president, I guess. I think that's what Barack Obama did, something along those lines. Now, we had her and we said to her, we use this chart. We said, if you stand on the Senate floor and you look at half your colleagues, 50% of the people in the Senate represent less people than you've got in the Inland Empire. Why? Because 25 of the 50 states have a smaller population than San Bernardino and Riverside counties together. And it is continuing to increase. The one we're chasing right now is Louisiana. They have about 60,000 more people than we do down there. When we pass them, more than half the states will have fewer people than our two counties. Uh, it's why I wanted to, frankly, cut the Inland Empire off, form a state so I could run for Senate against Kamala Harris because she wouldn't open an office in the Inland Empire as her colleague on the other, uh, Diane Feinstein had. Now, that's how big we are. How is our economy done? It is done incredibly well. We just lost something, let me back up. Oh, okay, sorry, didn't lose something. What about going forward? What about between 2018 and 2045, what does the state say about population increases in the Inland Empire? We're expected to add one and a half million more people, which will take us up roughly to 6.1 million people here. Now, do you want them here? As real estate agents, yes. As drivers, no. Now, looking at this, what do we see compared to other areas? L.A. County, the monster, expected to only add 893,000. What about San Diego, Orange, Ventura, and Imperial? If we add them together, they're expected to add 400,000 people less than our two counties. So this is the center of growth. Now, if you're a real estate person, or related to the industry, with those numbers, if you can't make money in this market, go get a job. <laughs> That'll take us up to 6.1 million, which is gigantic. Now, another important fact, the median income of the Inland Empire is lower than the surrounding counties at $62,303 in 2017. Now, above us is LA County at 65, way above us is San Diego, but as you all, I'm sure, well aware, prices of housing in the Inland Empire are cheaper than they are in the coastal counties. In fact, I don't think anybody in the coastal counties can afford to buy a home at all anymore, unless it's Bill Gates or somebody like that. So let's deduct from the others how much more expensive they are on monthly housing costs. When we do that, LA County has less disposable income after paying for housing than we do, and we're starting to catch up with San Diego County. 
So our income level here in terms of ability to spend after you've paid for housing is in better shape than it looks like just in the raw numbers. Now, how are we doing here? We're 15.6% as of 2018, higher than we were before the recession. We're up 15.6, California's up 11, the US, that number's wrong, is up 8.8. So how are we doing? We're doing almost double the US, it's substantially better than the state. So this area has been a job engine which is extremely important for the welfare of people who live here. Now every year economists make forecasts and one of the things that drives me nuts is if they don't tell you what they forecast and what happened. So I call it the confession. Last year I forecasted we would add 45,000 jobs here. We actually so far with the preliminary numbers, which will change by the end of this week, uh, it has this in at 44,558. I don't want the numbers to change. I am perfectly happy with that. Understand the way this is done. There's a lot of very sophisticated modeling. I go in my office, I put on a blindfold, a funny looking hat, and throw a dart at the wall, and that's the forecast. <laughs> so it came out pretty well this time. Now, Job quality is a huge Inland Empire issue. If we look at the high end of the economy, jobs paying 60,000 and above, in the state of California, that was 26.5% of all jobs created since the turnaround started in 2011. In the Inland Empire, it's only 10.9. And all of that is in one sector almost, which is healthcare. Other than that, we just haven't created the upper end of the economy in this market. If we look at office jobs that pay 45 to 60,000, what do we see there? Six, seven here uh, in the state, eight, six here, a little better. If we look then at the real key difference, blue collar jobs, then that's three main sectors, logistics, manufacturing, and um, construction in the state, 21.5, here, 39.7, huge share of our economy. Now, that middle between those last two, the blue collar jobs paying 45 to 60,000 and the white collar office jobs paying that same rate, that huge center meant, interestingly enough, that though we don't have a high end, we don't have as big a low end as the state. The state, the jobs it's created 2011 through 2018, 45% of them 30,000 and below. What about, actually it's 32,000, now it's creeped up a bit. For us in that range, less, 40.7. So at the low end, less of our job creation has been in those kinds of jobs. The state essentially has hollowed out its economy. It's creating a lot of high-end jobs and a huge number of low-end jobs. And this is not an accident. This is the result of state policies, which I'll talk about later. Now, how have we done compared to other places? Last year, the LA created 62,000 jobs. We created 44,000, and the rest of Southern California hardly counts. We're the two areas. Of course, LA County's economy is triple our size, so the fact that we have done that well compared to LA is actually amazing. In terms of growth rates, there is no question this has been the job engine in Southern California Actually, we've been adding jobs faster than either Silicon Valley or the San Francisco, San Mateo uh, area, Northern California. We have been the leader in that respect. So you're in an area that is firing on all cylinders. Unemployment in this region peaked at almost 15%. If we look at the US and this area, 
These are, you can see they're very close together. Whereas they had separated during the recession because we got killed during the recession because of what happened with mortgages, what happened with housing, what happened with construction. We've now pretty much got that out of our system. We have two huge issues for this area. One of those is poverty. We have too much of it. In uh, 2017, which is the most recent data from the Census Bureau, 19.3% of children under 18 lived in families below the poverty line. If we look at the surrounding areas, uh, LA is slightly worse, Orange County is better, and so is San Diego. If we look at all people, not just children, but including children, it's 14.5. Now, what jumped up were two little boxes. Box one, the share of children in poverty has dropped from 23.5 in 2016 to 19.3. So it got better as the economy has taken off. Similarly, 16.4 down to 14.5, overall poverty has gotten better as the economy has taken off. Now, let's talk about how an economy operates. Oh, sorry, the other problem we have. I want to get rid of problems and get on to the good stuff. What do we have here? This is a share of the population that are adults in the Inland Empire, high school or less. This is why we don't have a high end of our economy, because our labor force is not very well educated. A total of 45.7% of adults, high school or less, in 2017. That has improved a little bit, it was 46.3, and this is very slowly changing. If we look at the opposite, that is AA degrees and higher, what do we see? We're at 29.8%. We are competing with LA 39.2, Orange 48, San Diego 47. We just can't compete for farms that need people with AA degrees, BA degrees and higher. That is our big difficulty. It sort of explains why our economy has unfolded the way it has. And while so much attention now is on the question of how do we raise educational levels. Now, talking about how the economy operates, I want to take you into the future. That is a rocket. That rocket is going to the moon. It has a payroll on board. Why? Because we've discovered gold on the moon and the payroll is on the rocket going up to the Moon Mining Corporation. So that brings money to a place that didn't have it until that time. Now, what do moon miners need? Well, they need food. So we open on the moon a pizza parlor. Understand that the money that supports the people in the pizza parlor, that employment, is not fundamental to the economy. It is a secondary result of the money that came to the miners that got respent. Now, what else do miners need? Well, they need entertainment. So we open, maybe we don't. There we go, the Moon Nightclub. Now, the Moon Nightclub, again, the same thing. You want entertainment. You have to have entertainment for the miners, so you own the Moon Might Club. And that, again, the people working at the Moon Night Club are not fundamental to making the economy go. It is the miners that brought the money to the moon. Now, just sort of parenthetically, some of you may know I ran a casino in Nevada for two years in the outlying counties, and we had the Moon Night Club in my community. Uh, I can let you imagine what else it did besides serve drinks. Gives me sort of a warped ver vision of how economies operate. Now, what are you looking at here? What brings the money into our economy here? Okay, let's go forward here. Okay, 
The major sector doing it is logistics and distribution. It is our fundamental sector driving the Inland Empire economy by bringing money in, which shows up, let's say you have a woman working at Amazon. She goes to the hairstylist after she gets paid. Again, the hairstylist isn't fundamental of the economy. Logistics and distribution is. Her husband wants to put a deck on the backyard. He goes to um, Home Depot to get lumber. When he goes there, he's spending part of her check. Again, it's a reuse. The top of that doesn't drive the economy, the bottom does. That's the crucial piece. So, first of all, logistics. Second of all is healthcare. Third, construction. Fourth, manufacturing. And finally, high tech and all the stuff related to the higher end of the economy which is our itty bitty part of this particular economy. We have some. You have companies like um, uh, ESRI and Redlands. Uh, you've got companies here in Riverside uh, that are driving the economy by doing the, that sort of work. Now, looking at each of those sectors in turn, what do we see? Hello? Wake up. There we go. First of all, healthcare. Healthcare is our best paying sector of any size and growth between 2011 and 2018, responsible for just under 9.6% of our jobs. 33,192 people employed in that period of time. Sorry, $62,000 a year is the median pay. A median is half above, half below. It's the job pay right in the middle. A good paying sector allows people to get to the middle class. What's driven this, one of the major drivers, has been the Affordable Care Act. Back in 2012, we had 751,000 people with no health insurance. By the time we get to 2017, it's only 302,000. It has gone from 28.8 to 11.3% of our population, a decline of 60% in un people who did not have health care. Now, how many of you have had trouble getting an appointment with your general practitioner doctor? Raise your hands. If you haven't, you haven't really had to go to the doctor. Now, why is that a problem? It is a problem because this has dramatically increased the demand for health services. That's one of the ways it's helped drive our economy. Now, along with that fact is this chart. If we look at the state, for every healthcare worker, there is a population of 26.6 people. That's the ratio. One healthcare worker, 26.6 people. In the Inland Empire, one healthcare worker, 33.5 people. So we have, we're underserved. It's getting better, that red line is going downhill, even as demand has increased, but the result of that has been we're somewhat overwhelmed in the healthcare sector, so you expect it to grow. Now, part of the problem, however, is under the way the financing in medical works through the government, that somebody on Medicaid, and most of the increase has come about through Medicaid in this region, the healthcare sector only gets paid 65 cents on the dollar for what they spend to take care of people on Medicaid. So a lot of that growth, they haven't been paid enough to really handle it. So when we look at then what's happening to healthcare, I had forecasted last year we would add 3,500 jobs. The preliminary data has come in and it's only 1,800. I've talked to several local healthcare uh, professionals who are managing the sector 
And it's largely because of this underpayment that they get on Medicaid that has caused them to restrict their growth. Now, what do I expect it to be when we actually do the hard forecast after we get the revised data this week? I think it will be slightly stronger than 1800, but not a whole bunch. Now, logistics job growth. Logistics has added 81,075 jobs. That top blue line is the biggest by far. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you hate trucks? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you have bought something online? No, let's do it the other way. How many of you haven't bought something online last year? Raise your hand. There's one. You lose your American citizenship. <laughs> now, if you bought things online and you hate trucks, look in the mirror. It's your fault. <laughs> because the way we act is what's driving how our economy is operating. Second fact, look on the labels on your clothing. Now let's get us all arrested. I want you to take everything off that was not made in America. We would have a riot on our hands. Now, again, why are all these goods pouring into the ports of LA and Long Beach? It's your fault. You don't like trucks? Join a nudist economy. <laughs> this is 23.5% of all of our job growth since 2011. Huge share. It's actually more important than that because like the lady I talked about at work for Amazon, it also drives jobs at Stater Brothers, jobs at hair salons, jobs at re retailers generally. This sector, we'd still be in a recession if this sector had not largely replaced construction and manufacturing and job growth. It, median pay is 47,000 $900 in this sector, half above, half below. If we look in the center here, 1284 last March was what people starting in the sector, you know, graduate from high school, go to work in logistics, 1284. Now Amazon has subsequently come along and said, we're gonna pay everybody, including part-time workers, $15 an hour. So their competitors have had to keep up with that because we have a tight labor force and we're short on workers. So the result of that is when the new data comes out, it will be probably closer to $15. Now this is for someone with no background in anything. But if you look in the center here now, what do you see? Short-term on-the-job training 1567, medium term, which is you stay in the sector three to five years, you're up to $25 an hour. The point is the sector has upward mobility to the middle class. Now, the other issue here is what's driving this. We've already looked at you. It's e-commerce. All those big facilities being built for Amazon and other competitors of theirs. Uh, it was six tenths of a percent of all US retail sales. It's now up to 10% round figures of all US retail sales. It's growing at 14 and a half percent a year. How would you like your savings account, your 401k, your paycheck to be going up at 14 and a half to 15 and a half percent a year? That would be very nice. That's how fast this is growing. Then there's the ports. Ido Benzivi was talking about this. Last year, 9 million 20-foot equivalent containers. What the heck is that? Look at a railroad train going through with all those containers. They are 40 feet long. That's two what we call TEUs, 20-foot equivalent containers on each one of those cars. That's how we measure it because they originally started out at 20 feet then they expanded to 40. 
Nine million is the all-time record through LA and Long Beach harbors. So it is booming down there, despite all this trade stuff that you hear on the news. What about exports? Hardly moving. Exports are pretty much flat. So it's the imports that are driving the sector. Now, industrial space absorption. 22 million square feet during 2018 were taken off the market by new companies coming to the Inland Empire and adding jobs. 22 million square feet vanished. This is one of the reasons that sector is growing so fast. Hello, there we go. Vacancy rate, somebody asked that question. The vacancy rate is 3.7%. You could see it has been consistently low since the recession ended. So as fast as we are building it, it is being taken up. Now, 23 million square feet are under construction as of December. So we filled 22, we got 23 under construction, so the vacancy rate is, we're basically filling it as fast as we're building it. As a result, the value of those buildings is going up. It sits, as of December, 31% above the, the value of those buildings prior to the recession. Now, the other thing related to this is Ontario International Airport. Uh, this is cargo at the airport. As you probably know, it used to be owned by the city of Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles started messing around with it and tried to destroy it. Uh, I love this chart because it's now at an all-time record, and 2018 was 14.8 percent over 2017, which was also an all-time record. Once we got it away from LA, the thing, the place started booming. Uh, I love this simply because I gave a speech like this about three years ago. I didn't know because you can't see uh, whether or not there was a reporter in the room. There was, and I just happened to make the comment that the organization at LA City that ran the airports called LAWA, and I just mentioned the fact in, in parenthetically that I thought the LAWA board ought to burn in hell. <laughs> that made its way into the LA Times and I haven't done any work in LA County since. Now, one of the difficulties we face is we're running out of space. We now have room for 157 more million square foot facilities. However, if we take out the high desert, the Coachella Valley, and Edo's project in Moreno Valley, which keeps being sued, we only have room for 35 more. So we need Edo's project to get approved, and then from then on, it's the deserts are going to be seeing the operations go on. Now, I forecast 10,500 jobs in this sector. It came in at 11,000, and I think this year it'll be a little bit weaker because we're running out of land. And that's the difficulty we never anticipated. Manufacturing, 14,242 jobs, just 4.1% of our growth. This sector pretty much has stopped growing. Good paying sector. Come on, get this stupid thing to go. There we go. 54.8, very good paying sector. We like that. Here's our problem. Our manufacturers are in California. California's manufacturing sector has only added 5.6% of the 1.2 million square feet added in the United States. Excuse me, jobs. 5.6% uh, of the jobs in the country have been in our state. That's all. Even though we have the biggest manufacturing sector in the country, it's just not growing. If somebody says, oh, there's all these green jobs being created, well, if they are, they're not here, they're someplace else. 
That is propaganda, not data. Now, to explain how that works, here are the costs of electricity for manufacturers in the Western United States. What do we see? Highest Colorado, 724. Lowest Washington, 437. Then we put in California. Now, you're the economic development director of Phoenix or Las Vegas. A manufacturer you hear is interested in coming to California. You show them that chart. They ain't coming here. And that's not an accident. This is state policy and operation. Basically, the way we're handling energy in this state has driven the cost to an absurd level, and the result of that is to kill off manufacturing growth in this state. So, look, that's how much more, if you look at the bottom two, Arizona, we're 83.5% more expensive, Nevada, we're 135% more expensive. Now there is one good piece of good news in, in manufacturing. <laughs> I will only leave that chart for your contemplation. However, as somebody that sort of remembers the 1970s, it's fun to finally see those little green boxes added on to medical marijuana. <laughs> now, manufacturing I thought would add 200 jobs. Uh, in fact, it ordered 750. What do I think with the final? I think it'll be between those two numbers this next year, hardly growing, unfortunately. Construction growth now, the sector most closely allied with you, 12.1%, 41,642 jobs, but mostly not in residential. This is a lot of infrastructure, it's also building the big buildings. Now, good paying sector, 53,000. If we look at growth, however, and you're more aware of this than I am, look at the growth year by year, quarter by quarter by quarter, it's a horizontal line almost. So there's not any growth going on in home sales, new and existing, going on in the Inland Empire, these data are seasonally adjusted, but it shows the problem we have of more demand than supply, and when you have that, then you get this chart, the blue peaked at 437 in new homes, now up to 457. So as a result of that, what we're looking at is new homes cost more now than they did back at the peak. Existing homes peaked at 389, 350 is where they are now. So as a result of that, they're 10.1%, sorry, 10.1% lower still than they were at the absolute peak. Now, why does the Inland Empire keep growing? The answer to that's on this chart. Inland Empire, medium price, $368,000. What do we see in LA? 619 or San Diego, 620. Orange, 797. The yellow bars are what you save if you decide not to stay in those counties, but to move here. And you can see the savings is from 250 on up to $429,000. So we grow, which creates for you a potential market. Now, in terms of apartments, they are also still expensive. They are up to 1487 here with a fairly low vacancy rate. That is the cheapest in Southern California, but 1487 isn't really very cheap. Job growth, I expected 7,500. Came in at only 4,300. I think it'll be about the same this year. Assess valuation goes along with this. As you can see, it is climbing. In San Bernardino County, it is far above where it was back when the recession started. Riverside County still, though it's up, hasn't caught up with inflation. I'm gonna go through these now. 
Finally and lastly, the, the high end of the economy. Oh, this is median for finance and education, 57,109. Those are in education and financial services, which includes all of you that are involved in the real estate sector. Median income is that. What did I think would happen here? Did it go up 5,000? It went up 6,000. I think what it's gonna do, it's going to be about the same. Now the high paying sectors. Here's our problem, we haven't got much. We do have Esri with Jack Dagerman and Redlands, Bourne's Electronics in Riverside, Sorensen Engineering in Ukaipa, um, Sigma Net, which is a firm that works between people that need software and people that make it. It's the people who can talk to both. If you've ever talked to a programmer, they don't speak English, so you need somebody to translate. Now, what are we seeing here? Come on. A half percent of job growth across professions, management, higher education, mining, utilities, information, and government. Now, these sectors pay really well, that's the private sector median, over 75,000. There's the government at 63.5, but these are not a growing part of our economy. And part of it is because of education. If you look at BA, we're at 21.4%. You can see that the competitive economies are all much better off. It has improved slightly, despite a ton of effort to move it. Where are the high paying jobs? It's where the high priced real estate is. So if you look up here, the purple lines are the counties. Education above them, Indian Wells, Loma Linda, Chino Hills, Rancho Mirage, that's above orange. Below orange, but above San Diego, Rancho Cucamonga, East Vale, Redlands. Below San Diego and above LA, a bunch of Coachella Valley cities, Upland, and then the Temecula Marietta area, and then just below LA is uh, Canyon Lake and Grand Terrace. So that's where you can find an educated workforce in the Inland Empire. Office absorption, which is related to the high end of the economy, is boring. It's hardly moving. Office vacancy rates have finally come down. That one out of four square feet was vacant back in the recession. It's down to under 10. E-commerce is hurting this market, quite frankly, because if you need to deal with a financial planner, mine was in Riverside, she now is in Pasadena. My accountant was in San Bernardino, he's now at Newport Beach, they can do it all online now. A lot of the documents that you use in your field can handle online. So we don't have the office space requirement we used to have. Now that brings us to passenger services, Ontario. What do we see here? Up 12.4, but that's only the 1988-89 level. What's happened since then? Well, a couple of things. First of all, the population has gained 2.4 million people, 108%, more than doubled. The number of jobs is up 133%. The number of companies is up 187%. Put that all together, and the fact of the matter is, we just should have a much bigger airport, and if it hadn't been for LA by now, we would have. Like I said, they should burn in hell. <laughs> 4,000 4, was my forecast for high paying sectors. It came in at 3,200. I think it'll be about the same. And the retail market, I'm just gonna put this up here real quickly and end with this. Retail market is really shown by these four pictures. Picture number one, Sears. What's happening to large anchor tenants? They're going out of business. Second, Nordstrom's. That's one that's doing really well. 
The only thing is, I hate Nordstrom's. I really don't, except my wife has a personal buyer at Nordstrom's and I keep having to work because of them. That's just parenthetically. In and Out Burger, the sector within retailing that's booming has been restaurants and bars. And so that's why that's up there. And then finally, Mexico Cafe, why? Because when I get out of here, I'm gonna go to Mexico Cafe and have a margarita. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Husing, or Dr. Husing. Um, were we gonna bring the Jimmy John Gallup here real quick? What are we gonna do here? Is Alicia, is that you coming up here? Okay, while we're getting John's PowerPoint, or not John's, while we're getting Bruce's PowerPoint set up, and we're a little over on our schedule, we're not going to cut your time, Bruce, you're going to keep going. We're unfortunately going to probably have to cut into our Q&A a little bit, so we'll see how that goes. But at any rate, I wanted to just take 60 seconds. This is Alicia with Jimmy John's. They're bringing food, so I thought I'd give her a minute to say hey. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Who has a Rumley in their chumley, right? Uh, Jimmy John's team, please stand up. In the house. Woo -wee. All right. Well, thank you very much, you guys. Um, just really quick, uh, we obviously have a booth back there. We're here to promote. We, do we deliver for one dollar, and we will never ever go third party. One dollar, you can order a minimum one sub or up to a million subs. We also offer catering options. So go see us in the booth. We have box lunches. We have uh, catering platters, and we also have the mini jinnies. Which guess what? They're in the house. Woo! So. Um, be quiet about it at your leisure. Go ahead, go in the back and grab a mini Jimmy uh, sandwich sample and please see us after for more information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jimmy Johns. And the food will be out there. Nobody wants to miss Bruce and Chris, so um, they got plenty. So with any further ado, Mr. Norris, come on down. Thank you. Lance, Lance. Ah, there we go. You know what? I'm going to try to stay on time because I want to hear what Chris has to say. So, you probably have chart coma by now anyway. So, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some things maybe that will help you have a better year. We're going to have a Q&A up here and you can ask me about charts from maybe that position. But I'd like Chris to have his full time and uh, like for you guys to be able to leave on time. So. Um, my whole life changed in 1981. I attended a seminar by Jim Rohn. Um, I didn't want to go. It was mandatory for the job I had. I got there. Unfortunately, we had the front table. And it was three hours long, and I remember thinking, my God, that's six sermons. I don't, I don't know if I can live through that. After about ten minutes, I, I took my first note, and I showed it to the person that was with me. And it said, this guy doesn't need our money. I'm always conscious of people's objectives when they speak. What's in it for them? Why are they saying this? I look at reports the same way. And for this night, I looked at what he was saying. And at the end of the, at the, end of the night, there wasn't anything to buy in the back of the room. I think he had somehow changed his life to such an extent by what he had learned that he wanted to pass that on. And I bought into it, and for three hours I took notes, and I still have those. And um, I got home that night, and I set my first set of goals that I ever set. And it was exciting because goals, you're sort of foretelling your future. It's not here yet, but when you write them, it's, it's like they're already alive and, and, uh, and here. And I woke up in the morning, I read them, and I went to bed at night. And I believe goals have changed my life. And I, and I want to encourage you to do the same thing if you don't have a set of goals. Now, if I can learn how to forward this, we'll be in good shape. Pardon me? There we go. I hope that stays right there. How many people know who this guy is? This is Jim Velvano. He's a coach of NC State. He took the place of a guy named Sloan. Coach Sloan was a very popular coach, one of the best in the nation. If you were a top high school player, you wanted to go pay, play for Coach Sloan. Then Coach Sloan decided he would quit. And he left an opening, and Jim Valvano got the job. So if you, were a, if you were a player on the team, you were disappointed that Sloan left, and here's your new coach. First practice, 
You come in and guess what's missing for a basketball team? No basketballs. He has a ladder under the basket with a gold set of scissors. And guess what they spent the whole practice doing? They cut the nets down. In college basketball, what's significant about that? When you win the NCAA title as a team, you cut the nets down. He was putting in their mind three years from now, together, we're going to cut the nets down and win the NCAA title. And guess what? They did it. That's a pretty cool story. It's a documentary. Maybe you should take time to see. I'm going to tell one more story. Again, I'm having a little trouble making this go forward. How many people know who this guy is? That's George Foreman, kind of the chubbier version. George Foreman used to be a ripped 22-year-old, was a heavyweight title holder, and he was a terror. And he held the title, lost a couple of times, retired at an early age, and for 20 years he was basically connected to a Houston boys club for a long time. At about the age 44, the boys club ran out of money, and he thought, you know what, I'm going to have to keep this going another way. So he said, you know what, the only thing I know how to do is to box. So at age 44, he got back in the ring and he, and he put his gloves back on to the ridicule of everybody in sight. Fat George, you know, and guess what? He knocked out his first 19 oppon opponents on his comeback. He was now ready to fight the number two challenger in the world, a guy named Adelson Rodriguez. Right before the fight, he gets interviewed by Johnny Carson. Johnny asked him, he says, uh, this Adelson Rodriguez fellow, is he any good? And Foreman says, I sure hope not. <laughs> well, I, he wasn't as good as Foreman. Foreman knocked him out in the second round and fought Holyfield for the title. And in a really great fight, Holyfield beat Foreman. Foreman's being interviewed after the fight. And the announcer said, well, George, you've got to be really proud of yourself. You put up a heck of a fight. And to this foreman said, you know what, I didn't come here to put up a heck of a fight. I came here to win my title back. And I was surprised at the intensity of that answer. A year and a half later, foreman gets to fight for the title again against the guy that beat Holyfield, Michael Moore. A friend of mine, it's important to have friends that have uh, lofty goals, he said, one of, my, one of my goals this year is to attend a heavyweight title fight. I happen to have ringside seats. Would you like to go? Uh, yes, I would. And so he and I went to the fight. We were ringside for this fight. Foreman lost the first nine rounds. Uh, in the 10th round, he hit Michael Mora with a right hand, hit him one more time. Mora was out. The, the noise level in that stadium was unbelievable. It was the loudest noise I ever, ha ever heard, and it lasted for five minutes. The same announcer interviews George Foreman standing right in front of me. He says, George, you've got to be really proud of yourself tonight. You got your title back. And I thought, what is George going to say? I mean, he's been ridiculed for this whole three or four year process. Man, this is your night. You have the title to the biggest championship there is in sports. What's going to come out of this man's mouth? And what came out uh, shocked me. It's, he said, you know, it's not, such, it's not so important that I got my title back. What is important is you live in a country that gets you to pursue your goals and you can pursue them until you get what you come for. Um, when I heard it that night, I, I cried. I looked at him. I said, did you hear what he said? To be honest with you, this industry did that for me. When I got married, I was 17. I got fired five times in a row. My resume would not have let me in very many places. But this place only asked one question. Will you keep on trying until you, you, to, uh, until you succeed? And uh, that's what this business is all about. And that's what you guys do every day. I'm going to leave the charts for another day. You're going to have a chance to listen to Chris, and I'd, I like to listen to him myself. And I'll be in a Q&A, and if you have any questions on charts, we'll deal with them then, okay? So thank you very much.